Welcome to Live Well, Be Well with your host, Sarah Ann Macklin. If I can just ask one thing to my new or old listeners, please hit the subscribe button and also share this podcast with friends. It means more than you realise. People that work like you did last night really late in the week, but then play catch up at the weekend and maybe a bit more sensible. That's still social chat lag. So it doesn't just refer to people that have crazy weekends. <laughs> it could be either way around. But it's that misalignment of your circadian or body clock. And what we found that's just been published today is that for those that have social jet lag, so have this misalignment, they have an increased level of inflammation, they have a less healthy diet, and really interestingly, we see a difference in the composition of their microbiome. In today's episode, I interview nutritional scientist at King's College London, Dr. Sarah Berry. I want to ask you a question and just take a moment to actually look at the complexity of your own diet. Do you analyse calories? Do you look at macros? Or do you follow a specific diet to optimise your health? As a nutritionist, I am always interested in what inspires people to pick these choices. And in today's episode, you may be surprised that the type of diet style you have adopted may not really be having as much of an impact as you wished. As individuals, we are complex. But in today's episode, we break down how complex the food we consume is too and how this impacts our own health outcomes. Dr. Sarah Berry is a reader in nutritional science and is the lead nutritional scientist on the Zoe Predict study, which you may remember if you listened to Tim Spector's episode I recorded with him a few weeks ago. We delve into the complexity of food versus the complexity of us. Dr. Sarah Berry has focused on the food matrix to help us learn even more around the complexity which lies in our own responses to food. We explore the concept of how and when we eat can have a dramatic health outcome on our health markers, looking at social jet lag and time-restricted eating. Sarah Berry, welcome to Live Well, Be Well. Thank you for having us in your gorgeous home, round the corner from where I live. (laughs) (laughs) It is a real pleasure to interview today, and I know we've been speaking to a lot of your team as well at King College and Zoe. Tim Spector's podcast was released just a few weeks ago, so it's fantastic to tie on this, to look a bit more around personalised nutrition, but not just that, looking at the complexity of food, the complexity of us, and really exploring that a bit deeper. Before we start... I'd love to ask you an opening question, which I ask all my guests, yep. and that is, in the last decade, what have you changed your mind about? Oh, gosh. Am I allowed lots of things? <laughs> 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 Loads of things. Um, so related to food and nutrition, I think the biggest change is not thinking about nutrients, but thinking about foods, not thinking about saturated fat, but thinking about the food it's in. So moving away from any thought around this reductionist nutrients approach and just thinking about the food. That's quite hard to admit as a scientist, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you know, the the area of nutrition and research is evolving Mm -hmm. so quickly. And so every year I'm changing my mind about something. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important as scientists that we have the courage to say, do you know what, I said this last year, but there's new evidence, I was wrong. Mm -hmm. And now this is, you know, the way we're thinking. But hey, in a year's time, I might be saying something totally different. Well, let's talk about what you're finding out about today, because I know that you do a lot of work. And in the last 20 years, you've looked a lot around the complexity of food and yep. food structure and that's where we really want to delve into today because I think when we look at personalized nutrition which is much as you've been doing you know you've been leading the predict study and all the sub studies that come off that from King's College and you're working with Zoe which is this new AI technology to really help us decode and understand our own matrix within ourselves and how we respond to food and we're going to get into that a bit later but First of all, I thought it was really interesting the research you were doing around the complexity of food and actually the structure itself. And when we had this conversation, you mentioned actually a really good stat to me where when we actually look at foods, there's actually 20 different thousand chemicals within that food. But we really only seem to look at fats, carbohydrates, proteins and and certain micronutrients. So can you divulge a little bit into this area of the complexity of food? Yeah, I think it's something that is overlooked and I think is a real problem in the area of nutritional research and also in the area of personalised nutrition as well because we're understanding, like you said, we're really complex as individuals. 
But what we're not recognising enough, I think, is the complexity of food. There's been this very traditional reductionist approach where we've looked at the macronutrients, we've looked at the micronutrients. So we've typically thought of food as consisting of 30 different chemicals. But like you said, it consists of more than 20,000 for most foods. And as well as the chemicals in food that differ, the structure of the food's really important. So something called the food matrix, which is a simple way of talking about the, the structure of the food. And then there's another third component that, again, I think people don't recognise enough is of the interactions you have either between the chemicals in the foods, but also between different foods. So this is why we need to think about food in terms of, or our diet in terms of our overall dietary habits. So not just about, you know, back a pack labelling, oh, how much saturated fat does it have or how much carbohydrate, but how are you eating this as a whole dietary pattern over the day? And also something else to add that's really important as well is how we eat. And so I always think when we think about how we respond to food, how healthy our diet is, we need to think about the complexity of us the complexity of food but also really importantly the complexity of our dietary patterns so time of day sleep etc and we can pick up on that definitely we're, we're going to end the podcast with how we eat and I Great. think that's going to be absolutely <laughs> fascinating I think that's what people will want to take home after this podcast so going into the complexity of food and it is honestly nutritional science I think is one of the most under-researched areas yep. but also one of the most complex I can totally understand that the normal average individual who hasn't trained in nutrition and just wants to live a healthy balanced diet I can feel so overwhelmed with all of this research so I hope today we don't overwhelm but we just try to gain a bit more insight into sometimes it's not as easy as just counting calories which is now it's kind of on the menus you know or just trying to look at our macro splits which is how most people today try to view their diets um to grasp some understanding on their health so let's go into the complexity of foods because you've done some really interesting research as you mentioned around such as the cell wall and how certain components of foods differ in our responses within us so could you give us a bit of information around how even the same type of food yep. but when actually processed in a different way yep. can have a different response to us yeah absolutely so I think this is a great example again of how kind of reductionist taking a nutrient only approach is and also I think the folly of also looking at food labels which mm. I'm a little bit anti so I'll give you an example that I think illustrates this really nicely so if we were to take almonds so almond nuts as an example and we were to feed uh, you whole almonds so how we typically consume almonds as a snack and then I was to feed you another day finely ground almonds on the back of pack labelling, they would say, nutritionally, these are identical. They have the same amount of calories. They have the same amount of fat. However, how your body processes them is totally different, despite having exactly the same chemical composition. And it's because this matrix, this structure is broken. And so what happens is, is when we grind the almonds, we break the cell wall structure. And cell walls are actually just fibre, which is also why, and maybe we can pick up on this, mm -hmm. I have a bit of an issue with fibre added back into food and suddenly being told it's really healthy. But the cell walls, which are the fibre component of plants, also act to keep this kind of structure of plants. And so in almonds, for example, when the cell walls are intact, which is what happens when you consume whole almonds, a lot of the fats retained in those cell walls, you don't digest it properly. So although you fracture some of the cell walls when you chew the almonds, the cells are so tiny. And actually what happens is, is about 30% of the fat and therefore about 30 to 40 percent of the calories is actually excreted so when you consume the whole almonds you're providing great food for your microbiome which is great and you're also actually excreting a lot of the calories now when you're consuming the finely ground almonds all of those cell walls are fractured mm. and so the lipid is released and so you're getting the full calorie amount you're also absorbing all of the other fat soluble vitamins so it's a little bit of a double-edged sword depending on whether you want the calories or, or the the vitamins but the point is is that if you were making that dietary choice based on the back of pack labeling and unfortunately as many do based on the calorie content mm. you would think oh almonds and you know I hear this all the time oh, I can't eat nuts they're so high in fat and it's like no if you if you eat them as whole nuts half of the fats coming out they're a great source of fiber etc also as well what happens as well as the energy value the way your body metabolizes it and the changes in your circulating blood immediately after consuming it is very different as well and maybe we can pick up on this a bit later yeah this is going to come into the postprandial which is the yep. post meal what yep. happens when we <laughs> when we eat the food people are probably going and what happens we will get there 
it's really interesting because obviously you also made, and I think a lot of people eat almonds and will reference that, but you also made the same comparison to me earlier around whole oats yep. as well. So even when we're looking at our breakfast choices, yep. you know, looking at ground oats and whole oats, yep. very different. So I'm going to name some names here, but like Ready Breck, they are put out as to this is a healthy start to your yep. day. <laughs> However, one, they're normally filled with a lot of sugar and added sugar and stabilizers. But two, these again, they're milled, they're ground down, so we're going to have a different response within our bodies. And I think, as you said, on on comparison, they look very similar. But actually, in reality, they're very different. Can I ask your opinion, first of all, before I ask the next question, around also how people can navigate this within a supermarket? Because you just mentioned about the added fibre and things that are added into foods. We see this a lot in plant-based milks. Mm -hmm. Whereas these are really healthy for you, they have got these additional vitamins and minerals added in. How can people navigate actually what is what is good and what is bad when they're in that shopping aisle? Yeah, I think it's really tough. I think there's a couple of simple tricks that you can use. So the more ingredients that are in the food, generally the more ultra processed it is, the less the food looks like the original food. Again, the more the matrix is destroyed. So what we want to think about is, is it in its original structure and how much added chemicals are in there? Now, some of these added chemicals and fortifications you know, have some favourable effects. The example I used of fibre earlier is a really good one, that fibre is there in nature to act as a wall, you know, Mm. to have this structural effect. And so if it's consumed in its whole form, now this isn't necessarily the same for soluble fibres, but for most plant-based fibres, they're better if they're in the plant, in the original structure that they were planned uh, to be in. Another example, I think, as well, of where fortification it can be almost deceiving about, and by looking at the back of pack labelling uh, that I often use as an example from cornflakes. And it's an experiment I do at the kids' school and uh, we even do at the university, to, to a great visual experiment where if you were to take cornflakes, um, now on the back of pack labelling they say they're a great source of iron, so they're fortified with iron, but it's actually elemental iron, which is like iron shavings. People can try this at home. If you take a uh, plastic pint glass it has to be quite thin plastic pint glass fill it with water fill it with half ground or like just like kind of bashed up cornflakes leave it for half an hour get a magnet hold the magnet around the plastic cup and you'll actually pour pull the iron shavings out and you can actually see and I've got some pictures I can show you later you can actually see the iron shavings like someone's just taken a bit of iron and shake. You don't absorb this. It's not bioavailable. But on the back of pet label, everyone thinks, oh, I'm feeding my kids this great source of iron because it's fortified, which is crazy. And then, you know, picking up on another point as well of the whole kind of, I think, misrepresentation of labelling. Mm. And if we can use oats as an example yeah. again. So if you take the ground oats you have this really big increase in sugar uh, blood sugar you have this big dip in in blood sugar and it initiates a whole cascade of downstream effects that we know are unhealthy now if you take exactly the same oats that haven't been ground what happens is, is you have a really blunted sugar response you don't have this increase in inflammation that you would see with the big peak you don't have this impact as well in terms of dips and hunger and yet again on the back of pack labeling they're identical but it's just about changing that food structure and this is also why i think that it's really misleading to say just because it's plant-based it's healthy so take some of these oat-based milks for example mm. people are consuming these often because they think they're a healthier alternative now I know that there's the whole ethical and you know climate and other reasons for choosing plant-based but for people that are choosing these plant-based milks thinking oh it's so much better for my body than dairy actually most is the matrix is totally destroyed from the oats there's loads of added chemicals put in the fibers taken out and added back in but out of the matrix and it's just really not good for you. The problem is, though, it has plant-based on it. It has all of these lovely, like, you know, instead of this shiny wrapping, it's often got this matte wrapping that people think, oh, you know, it's so much more wholesome for me, so it must be good for me. And it's got the plant-based label. It's really, really misleading. And I think, you know, they are there to catch your eye into trying to make that yeah. healthy choice. And this leads me into a question, actually, which I'm just thinking about when you were talking about it. You do have certain companies selling products that you don't actually need to consume any food because this one product will contain all of your macro and micronutrients in the day that you can drink throughout the day in three different stages 
just hearing about the complexity of food and the breakdown of food and actually how taking out and grinding foods, milling foods, all of these processes that are leading to ultra processed foods. What's your thoughts on these companies that are saying, actually, if you have these drinks three times a day, you don't need to consume food and you will be meeting all of your recommended daily allowances mm -hmm. for all of your carbohydrates, fats, mm -hmm. proteins and, and vitamins and minerals. Well, I think that brings us back to what we said at the very beginning. It's taking that reductionist view, which I said I have changed in the last decade. So 20 years ago, I might have had a very different answer. But it's saying that as long as you just give yourself the correct nutrients, then you're fine. Well, no, we know that's not the case. We know that it's so important to modulate how those nutrients interact, how you metabolize them. And that's why you need to eat real food. So let's have a look then at how that does interact with, within us. So the complexity of food is really important. And it is important because all of these components work together. Yep. A little bit like, a, like an army. They all kind of help one another out. Yep. Obviously, when they're ingested, what's the importance then of the breakdown of this metabolism and this bioavailability from this complex structure of food compared to one that's ready-made, that's meant to be giving you everything you need throughout the day? Yeah, so when you consume food, you have very short-term changes in circulating metabolites in your blood. And we call this postprandial metabolism. So postprandial is basically just Latin for meaning post-eating. Mm -hmm. And we now know in nutritional research that the postprandial responses, so typically we mean between zero to eight hours after consuming a food, is what actually underpins many of the long term, so what we call the chronic effects of food on health. And previously this was ignored, so when you're asked to go to the doctor to measure your glucose or your cholesterol uh, levels, you're asked to go fasted, aren't you, mm. having not had anything for breakfast. But what we know is that when you consume a carbohydrate-rich meal, you have an increase in what we call postprandial glycemia. And this is the circulating glucose in your blood, or we can simply also call it blood sugar. Mm. Um, and that reaches a peak around 30 minutes after consuming any carbohydrate-rich meal. It returns to baseline around two hours, and some people also get a dip after. And then the fat in the meal causes something called postprandial lipemia, which is basically an increase in circulating triglycerides, which is basically another word for the fat that's in our food. And that peaks around four hours, returns to baseline around eight hours. We don't just consume one meal a day, do we? Or most people don't. <laughs> You know, typically in most Western eating uh, patterns, we consume two to three main meals, two to three snacks a day. So what this means is if you think about the responses that I've just described and you map this onto these six eating events throughout a day, we don't spend our day, do we, in that fasted state when you're going to the doctor and having your glucose measured. You're spending our state with, you know, these oscillations, this like peaks and troughs in blood glucose. You're spending your day with this kind of gradual incline in circulating triglycerides in this lipemic state. So you're spending most of your day in this state of metabolic flux. Mm. And this is really important because we know that these peaks and troughs in glucose and these elevations in triglycerides throughout the day initiate a cascade of events that we know if exaggerated and repeated extensively day in day out can have unfavorable effects on our health and we now know from work that we've been doing and others have been doing that they're a really important risk factor for many chronic diseases and is this through the predict study so um I mean, it's something i've been researching for the last 25 years at king's but mainly looking at how we can change the food that we eat to modulate these. But with our Zoe Predict study as well, we're looking at how these responses vary to in, with the individuals. So we know that we can manipulate um, people's responses, so these postprandial responses by manipulating the food, but we also know that each individual responds really differently. So from the Zoe Predict study where on some days we feed people exactly the same meal so nutritionally they're exactly the same we see about a 20 fold difference mm -hmm. in some of these responses and it's really important because what these changes in glucose and in triglycerides do is they initiate a cascade of unfavorable events so they initiate oxidative stress they initiate inflammation they remodel some of these particles in your blood called lipoproteins to become quite unfavorable uh, for you the dips in glucose stimulate hunger. There's lots of these events that then happen very, very quickly. And we can even measure this so um, physically. So we do something called flow-mediated dilatation, which is a measure using ultrasound where we can feed people high-carbohydrate or high-fat meals. 
And in the four hours after, we can do this ultrasound technique that actually looks at the health of the arteries. So can actually physically look at what's going on. And we see an impairment within about four to six hours after consuming these meals. Now it's transient. So if you were then to measure it, you know, 12 hours later, it would have returned. But what that shows you is you're giving these constant insults you know, you're sparking a fire constantly and we need to dampen down that fire. And are you seeing that there's a specific link between certain foods that are causing this more so than others? It depends on what outcome we're looking at. So mm-hmm. if we were to think about glucose, we know that highly processed, highly refined, kind of fast sources of glucose cause bigger responses. So using the oats as an example, the more processed it is, then generally the more accessible it is and the more quickly Um, it's absorbed, metabolised and causing these spikes. For blood lipids, so for triglycerides, postprandial lipemia, it depends on lots of different factors. It primarily depends on what else is in the meal as well as who you are as an individual. The type of fat is less important. So there's this fixation that I think many people have about whether, you know, it's poly, mono or saturated fat. But what our research is showing, it's about the food that it's in rather than the actual type of fat that's really important not saying that whether it's saturated or mono poly is is irrelevant but we need to I think about think about all of these nutrients in terms of the food that they're in Mm, it's really interesting actually because when we talk about fats a lot in nutritional science you hear a lot obviously from the NHS and and dietary guidelines and SACAN and all of these other research studies saying that polyunsaturated fats is the way to go so obviously we talk a lot about the Mediterranean diet and and so on and so forth, and you're going even deeper than that, and obviously saying partly important, partly not important. Yeah, so I think the epidemiological evidence, so from the big population studies, it's really clear that at a population level, saturated fats are bad for us, mono, um, polyunsaturated fats are good for us. Mm -hmm. But if we start looking at an individual level, and if we also think about the foods, I think the evidence is quite clear that it's a lot more nuanced than that. Mm. And so unfortunately in the UK now, most of our, or a large proportion of our monounsaturated fat is coming from highly processed foods. So it's, you know, your sunflower oil or your rapeseed oil added back into foods. Therefore, if we were to look at monounsaturated fat and the effect it has on health, it's from these foods, we know that it's bad, but not necessarily because of the type of fat, but because of the food that it's in. And then there's also the complexity again around how the inherent food matrix, the inherent food structure can also impact how these different fats affect our health. And dairy is a great example. So if you take butter, for example, which is not a fermented dairy, or you take cheese, which is a fermented dairy, they have similar fat composition, so similar types of saturated and monounsaturated fats, But the impact they have on your health is really different. And so that shows, again, if I was to look at back of pack labelling of cheese and butter, I'd think, oh, they must have the same effect on my health. But actually, Mm. it's not the matrix of the cheese modulates how that fat behaves in our body and actually prevents it from being unhealthy, which shows that now, again, thinking of all dairy as well in the same Mm. category as being unhealthy you know, again, is even too reductionist. That gives me a visualisation of the head as you're talking. And it's something that I speak quite openly about and have done in the last few years. It's around the eat well plate. And I'm not going to share my personal opinions right now because I'd love to hear yours. But we do have, again, this reductionist view that this is how your plate should be made. And one part is dairy, it's, it's very slitherous fat. They have now moved the Coca-Cola and the sweets just outside of the plate. But then we do have a third made up of carbohydrates and some more of protein. How should we be representing food? Just from everything that you're saying and the complexity in something like the Eat Well plate, how do you visualise that we should be actually translating this to the public? Wow, (laughs) that's a big question. (laughs) And I say this because it's so interesting hearing about the complexity, but the messaging we're giving out is completely different to this conversation. Yeah, I think this is where it's really difficult because we need to distill a very simple message to to people to be able to accommodate for people's different level of understanding, but also to be able to accommodate for people's different food preferences, different cultural preferences as well. So I, I actually feel that the guidelines that are put together are kind of are stacked against the people that are making these really. It's a really tough thing. Mm. One thing that I think is really important to say is that people are very critical of the guidelines. Mm. Now, 
the problem is uh, and they say that the guidelines are broken because you know we have all of these dietary related health issues if the guidelines worked then we wouldn't have any of these now only two percent of the uk population actually follow those eat well so the nine principles of the eat well Mm -hmm. guidelines and we've done some research some years ago at king's called the cressida study where we compared people's current diet in the uk we randomly allocated people to either follow the kind of typical british diet that we currently consume and then we randomly allocated another group of people to follow what's essentially the eat well plate diet Mm. and we actually found really big improvements in many health outcomes by following the eat well plate so i just would like to start by saying i don't think it's total nonsense I think that there's certain elements that I certainly don't agree with, particularly around fat. I don't think we should be in any way encouraging people to reduce their fat intake. Mm. I disagree with some of the elements around carbohydrate. But I think, can I create a better one? Can I visualise a better one? I have to admit defeat with that. I think the principles of trying to consume as much food in its original state, and I don't mean a raw food diet here, but trying to minimise your ultra-processed foods, trying to consume a diversity of foods, and particularly avoiding refined carbohydrates. Mm. If you can start with those as your basic principles, then I think you're doing okay. Mm. And I think that's my my bugbearer with the EWAP plate, and I do agree with what you said. It's so hard to get a very generalised viewpoint on diet when you can obviously hear from this conversation just how complex <laughs> yeah. it is. The bugbear that I have with it is that still within this plate there's so many processed foods and I think we need to start by just educating maybe not to even the complexity of foods but actually saying this is what processed food is and this is what not processed food is and I think if we can just start on that baseline we give people a much better head start but I think it can become very foggy in that view where you're looking at an eat well plate and half of the foods that are on there that are recommended are processed And so already people aren't having that head start of even navigating what is an ultra processed food and what is not an ultra processed food and why is that ultra processed food bad for me because tin baked beans have fibre in it so I know I'm doing really well but we also know that they're so full of sugar. Yeah, and salt. And so it, and salt exactly. And obviously we now know that that's really linked to metabolic conditions like type 2 diabetes. We also know cardiovascular disease. There's so many nuances into that and I think that's just my personal bit of bugbear with it because I think it's very mixed there with the messaging and you know I think it's really important to say that there is a variety of fruit and vegetables on them they do try and include diversity which I think is fantastic yeah. but it's just this miscommunication between as you were saying processed foods and ultra processed foods and in today's conversation we're going even deeper to say well when you look at oats how can you even tell which oats are processed and which are not processed and that kind of brings the next layer to it. And I just think that is a, a very Based important for making those choices that they can at least recognise on the food shelves, which can be very um, manipulated today by the food industry of which choices we should make. Using the word processing mm. uh, to mean bad for all foods as well, we need to avoid so that there is more clarity. So I think there's really clear evidence that ultra processed foods are bad for us. They affect our gut microbiome. They're associated with obesity. They affect inflammation, blood lipids, blood glucose, all sorts of things. They're hyper palatable. We tend to overeat them. But there's a whole category of processed foods, some of those on the eat well plate, that actually are fine. Mm. And actually also, it's important to recognise that processing, it's a double-edged sword, so it can actually allow us to consume foods that are more nutritious or that otherwise wouldn't be accessible and also form an important component of some people's diet that can't necessarily afford to buy fresh food. So I don't know if we take, for example, uh, frozen vegetables, that they're a lot cheaper than fresh vegetables and they actually often have a lot more of the water-soluble vitamins like Mm. vitamin C or potassium, for example, still capsulated within them. And yet, they have gone through some sort of processing. Mm. And so I think, again, trying to educate people that what is okay in terms of processing and what's bad in terms of processing is really Mm. important. So can you give us some examples? And this is going to lay the Sarah Berry eat well plate. (laughs) (laughs) Damn it. (laughs) Um, Okay, so uh, uh, the kind of ultra processed foods are the ones that have loads of added ingredients and have the structure removed. So that's kind of a simple way to think of uh, how processed they are. 
So we mean things like pork pies, um, baked beans, for example, a lot of the condiments, you know, tomato ketchup, those kind of things that are on your table. A lot of the snack bars that, again, sometimes people think they're, they're healthy That's because they have, you know, great source of protein, great source of fibre. Mm. These are all ultra processed as well. The snack bars is the biggest thing. Whenever I go home to my parents, you know, that's their healthy snacks. Yeah. And I'm trying to say <laughs> they're really not healthy. They're not whole foods. They are. And my dad is a previous type diabetic, so even more my alarm bells go off when I, when I see these. And, you know, they're intelligent people. So it's, it's not a, I think it's just a misguidance of information that we've been giving. Yeah, I think as well, we need to think about the pra- pragmatic side of things. I'm a nutritional scientist. After this, I can show you my fridge and I can show you my store cupboard. And I think you'll be absolutely shocked that a high proportion of the food is ultra processed. Mm. So in the UK, we know that we get more than 50% of our calories, our energy from ultra processed food. And sadly, my kitchen is reflective of that. I'm a busy working mum. My kids like these kinds of ultra processed snacks. I'm rushing to pick them up after school. I don't have time to quickly cut up some nice, I don't know, strawberries, whatever. Or, mm. or you know, often I don't have them fresh in the house because I haven't been to the supermarket to get them. So I grab one of these ultra-processed snack bars. Mm. You know, I do, do their pack lunch like I did this morning in a matter of minutes. And I just grab what's easy in there. So mm. it's all very well educating people. We're so much busier now. Mm. And particularly now that we've moved away from that old-fashioned approach, thank goodness, of, you know, the, the females being at home and spending their day preparing food for the family. You know, certainly when I'm preparing dinner, it's whatever, again, I happen to have in the cupboard to feed mm. the kids. Mm. It is really important, isn't it, to bring it back to reality of, um, you know, actually just how busy we are and there is so much convenience around our lives. But I think something that I guess whenever anyone is trying to make a change, whether it's diet, whether it's lifestyle, whether it's exercise, you actually have to put it in your diary yep. and allocate the time yep. to allow you to do that. And I think that's a trick that I'm finding for me is actually just allocating a, a diary slot to say, okay, this morning is my half an hour for exercise. Because if I don't, I will just get up and I will work. And it's the same with food. Yep. Even just doing that weekly food shop so you can kind of forward plan and go, I haven't got time because I'm so busy. I need to allocate an hour in my weekend just to give myself yeah. time to do that. Because it's very hard, I think. We can feel so overwhelmed with, oh my gosh, I've got to eat a certain way to prove my health and to reduce like chronic disease and keep my mind sharp and I have to do all these things. And it just feels so overwhelming of where to start. A trick that I'm starting to learn is I actually just diary slot it. And then, <laughs> okay, I need to do that. <laughs> and then I go, okay, so today I have to do X. And then you allow yourself that time to actually allow it to be implemented as opposed to that last minute moment but that takes me really nicely actually onto how we eat because as obviously this conversation has you know directed it's not just how we eat and 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 what we eat another really big part is is how we eat it and today as we're speaking I think you have an abstract coming out around social jet lag we do now people will be hearing this term social jet lag and be thinking what is this (laughs) but we're going to really kind of weave into the time of day that we're eating you might touch upon intermittent fasting you know something very topical which we just spoke about was you know being so busy and just grabbing in that moment the weekday rush so the weekday versus the weekend so can you tell me a little bit about this social jet lag abstract that you've just um, put out today yeah so something we're seeing that is really important like you say is it's not just who we are and our individual our individual variability in how we process food it's not just the complexity of food that we've talked about, but also we know that how you eat is so important. Mm. And this is all linked to your circadian rhythm. So, you know, the time of day, it's linked to your eating windows, it's eating to your eating frequency. Are you a snacker, a grazer, or do you just have one meal a day? But we also know it's also linked to what we something we call circadian misalignment. So not having consistency as well in how you eat and also though how you sleep, how you exercise, you know, the timing of all of these. And social jet lag is a great example. And so social jet lag is a term that basically refers to you having different sleep patterns on workday or weekdays versus weekends. It refers to your midpoint of sleep 
So when you go to sleep, if you go to sleep maybe at 10 at night and you wake up at six in the morning, your midpoint is two in the morning. Now that might be your typical weekday pattern and then at the weekend it might totally change you're going to bed at two in the morning and waking up at 11 o'clock for example and I can't do the maths for when that midpoint is at this precise moment but I think you get the point that your midpoint has totally shifted Mm -hmm. now you might still be getting the same amount of sleep but the timing that you're going to sleep is different and that's what's called social jet lag so for people that have uh, quite rigid weekday patterns but then go wild at the weekend they're experiencing social jet lag or people that work like you did last night really late in the week but then play catch up at the weekend and maybe a bit more sensible that's still social jet lag so it doesn't just refer to people that have crazy weekends Mm. (laughs) it could be either way around but it's that misalignment Mm. of your circadian your body clock Mm. and what we found that's just been published today is that for those that have social jet lag so have this misalignment they have an increased level of inflammation they have a less healthy diet and really interestingly we see a difference in the composition of their microbiome so we see that the people that have social jet lag have more of what we call these unhealthy bugs that we've identified from the zoe predict studies and they have less of these favorable bugs as well wow I'm really analysing my sleep patterns. We do realise now just how sleep is one of the most fundamental pillars of our health. Yep. And it really does cascade into every area of how we function the next day, into what we're eating. And I can imagine we probably have more distorted eating patterns because of ghrelin, the the hunger hormone. Yep. That obviously that seems to come into play when we're we're tired. How does this then interact with the gut microbiome in, in the terms of the good and the bad how does how does that play out with the social jet lag so it's something we don't understand yet and it's the kind of thing with the zoopedic studies we're going to probe into a lot more something that we have seen with again the predict studies is a lot around the impact of sleep so not just um, this misalignment so with social jet lag how much sleep you have the night before can directly impact your response to food the next day And so we recently published some research that looked at your duration of sleep, looked at your midpoint again, so the timing of sleep and also your efficiency of sleep. So, you know, whether you're tossing and turning in the night or you get that beautiful sleep. Now, what we see is if they are disturbed in any way, so if you're not getting the right amount of sleep and at the right time and it's not good quality sleep, the next day you will have a more pronounced postprandial glycemic response. So you will have a worse blood sugar response to a carbohydrate rich meal. Now the problem is, is when you don't sleep very well, the um, award area of your reward area of your brain is more heightened. So it seeks out these kind of more rapid glucose surges. So you tend to crave, um, as I think most people could Mm. relate to, the more kind of fast fix. You don't want to have that really healthy breakfast. You want a quick, nice sugar rush. And so you have that double whammy that you've got this reward center saying, please, let's eat, you know, all of these unhealthy carbs. And then when you have those carbs, you're having also an even greater response that you would have had than if you'd have had it maybe the day before when you had a good amount of sleep. What we want to start doing is seeing as well where the microbiome fits into all of that, but it's something we don't know at the moment. And so when people are waking up the next day, maybe like me to give context of last night, I was working to about 2am. So obviously my social jet lag would have been pushed forward quite a lot. What should I be eating in the morning? So if I'm going to be more sensitive to carbohydrates and my glucose response, should I be maybe trying to fast or should I be trying to have a protein rich meal or should I be trying to have a complex carbohydrate meal? Okay, that's a good question. And I think there's two strategies we can take. The first thing to say though is I do think you should to a certain extent have what you want. You know, <laughs> yeah. Food's there to be enjoyed, it's to bring us pleasure. And I think True. this is something we mustn't forget. Let's think of the endorphin factor as mm-hmm. well. Let's think of the fun factor and the pleasure factor of food. Mm-hmm. What we can do is, and I think this is what's really exciting about the how you eat and also about how different foods can modulate the effect of other foods, that to a certain extent you can still eat what you want to eat, but mm-hmm. you can modulate it by thinking about the how, how you eat or what other foods you're having. So if we take your example, like I said, there's two different approaches we could take. So first is you could be quite mindful of the fact that, you know, what, I'm probably going to have a worse glycemic response. And so, do you know, what, I'll try and avoid the refined carbohydrate breakfast. I'll try and go for something that is either less refined or I'll add more fat or I'll add more protein to it because I know it dampens down that uh, increase in blood sugar response. Mm. And so you're not kind of starting the fire in the first place. 
But if you do want that high refined carbohydrates because your reward signals are like, just give it to me, please, I feel rubbish, I'm tired, then what you can do is you can dampen the fire once it's started. And so by adding polyphenol rich foods to your breakfast, so, you know, let's say you want the really refined bread or whatever, if you can have some polyphenols at the same time, then even once you've had that big spike in glucose, adding the polyphenols to it reduces the inflammatory response. And we've seen this from our own studies where, for example, we will give someone a high carbohydrate meal, we add polyphenols to that high carbohydrate meal, you get the same increase in blood sugar, but you don't get the same increase in these inflammatory measures. And you also don't get the same impairment in your blood vessel function that I talked about earlier that we can measure, you know, using the ultrasound technique. Mm-hmm. So you as well as trying to stop the fire, you can actually dampen the fire once it's started as mm-hmm. well. And the polyphenols, they're all the colourful, rich foods that we're yep. talking about as well. So people might not understand what they're adding but that would be things such as your berries and your colorful rich foods maybe your seeds things that can obviously help slow down that that release of fiber rich foods yeah so polyphenols are what we call bioactives Mm -hmm. again these are what have been traditionally ignored in the the food labels where we only look at the 30 macro and micronutrients and it's these bioactives that we know so so important Mm -hmm. and modulate again a lot of the downstream effects of how foods impact our health And the polyphenol bioactives are found in a whole range of foods. Generally, like you say, if it's a pigmented, so it's colourful food, Mm -hmm. you're kind of onto a winner that's probably high in polyphenols. Mm -hmm. It's found in red wine, it's found in extra virgin olive oil, it's found in many fruits, particularly berries, and also found in lots of the the dark vegetables as well. Mm -hmm. And so that's just the moment to take. Actually, we always reference back to say, have a colourful plate, eat like a rainbow, and that's where this really does play a part. And I do agree with you, you should always try and eat to how you feel, but there's sometimes when it could actually make you feel worse. And maybe just taking that that moment of a breath to say, I really want this, but if I can add this in, it might make me feel better. I think it's just a very good present moment to to be in, to help you get through. Because I I think sleep is honestly one of the most detrimental things we can do for our health day to day. And it it does catch up with you that sometimes one bad sleep can actually have a knock-on effect for a few days because you could struggle the next night and then your food intake kind of goes out of whack. So that mindfulness that we have. But something I also mentioned that I would love just to touch upon before we end is is time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting. Um, Because I know a lot of people who listen to this podcast will be really interested in your views on this. Because we're looking at social jet lag and maybe that could lead into more intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating without actually realising because obviously they're sleeping in later and maybe they've missed the meal. Mm -hmm. Um, How does this impact our health and how we're feeling? And what's your views around breaking that fast and the complexity of foods to have? So I think that it's an area that kind of to watch the space around Mm. the research. I think it's relatively new area of research. Um, My opinion based on the current research and from what we're seeing from our Zoe Predict studies is that having a fast period of more than 12 hours or up to 12 hours is likely to be beneficial for most people. Obviously, we're all different. I think we also need to think about time-restricted eating in terms of the time that we do it and also how we can be adherent to it. And so for people that it's going to be just be too difficult to adhere to time-restricted eating, then it's not for you. But I think that having an eating window that is less than 12 hours the impact it has on your metabolic health, I think there's quite strong evidence to show it improves your metabolism even before it affects weight. And I think that's really, really important. You know, we know for people that typically want to change their diets because they want to lose weight, well, it's not sustainable, any weight loss diet, whether it's calorie based or, or other approaches. And that's what I think is quite exciting about the time restricted eating research, that we know the change in our metabolic health actually precedes the change in weight so by metabolic health I mean things like your insulin sensitivity your blood lipids for example that these reduce before we see the weight loss Mm -hmm. and I think that's quite exciting because I think that means that maybe then any weight loss that comes about as a byproduct of that is more likely to be sustained Mm -hmm. I think another area that um, lots of people are interested in is should I early time restrict eat or late time restrict eat so by this we mean should we try and front load so consume all of our meals earlier in the day you know let's say you know our period from eight in the morning till six in in the evening for example or should we do it later in the day from like midday till eight and I think that this is an area again where we don't know the answer yet what we see from our predict studies is that time of day is really important 
And we know that if we take blood sugar responses, so postprandial glycemia as an example, we know that if you consume carbohydrates in the morning, that you tend to have a lower glycemic response than if you consume them later in the day. But really interestingly, what we see is it's different for different individuals and particularly related to age. So for young individuals, we see that it's really pronounced that younger individuals have a lot lower glycemic response in the morning to the afternoon. But as you get older, it's less important. If we kind of extrapolate that to time-restricted eating, it might be that for younger individuals, doing early time-restricted eating is actually really favourable using this evidence that we've got from our own mm. timing of day work for older individuals it doesn't really matter and if you prefer to skip breakfast and then do it later that actually that's fine mm. but again this is something we're looking into with our data so again come back in a few years and I hopefully I'll have an answer <laughs> rather than have changed my mind <laughs> I like the forever changing concept I think that shows it's a good scientist um and so something I'd love to wrap up with is we obviously talked about something that you've changed your mind over in the last 10 years but what's the one piece of wisdom you feel that you've really gained over the last 10 years? Oh my gosh, these are th this first and last question are <laughs> tough. I think it's that it shouldn't be all about what you eat. And I think that this has evolved in my understanding over the last 20 years that the whole how we eat that we've talked about and the who you are is equally as important as what you eat and that we should think therefore about the key pillars of health so we should not just consider our diet when we want to improve our health we should think about our diet we should think about our sleep we should think about our physical activity and we should think about our mental health and I think they're so interrelated and we shouldn't look at any of those uh, in isolation. I completely agree when I went to go and interview Professor David Nutt who looks at the drug science element of our mental health so neuropharmacology he looks at and his kind of lasting question was about gut health and he was obviously I've been so drawn into and obviously my passion is around neuropharmacology and, and how our minds react mm. and the power of our minds but actually now he's understanding how important our gut microbiome is to feed our minds. Yeah. And it's where we kind of have pigeonholed areas yep. and all look to these little areas of research, you know, intensely, but not join the dots. Absolutely. I think this is what's really exciting with the Zoe research is that we're capitalising on citizen science, we're capitalising on all of these novel technologies to do the world's largest nutrition research programme so that we have scale, breadth and depth, which means we can look at all of these, what we call exposures, so all of these different factors and loads of different outcomes. Mm. So typically in nutritional research, and you know this is what I had done for the previous 20 years, we look at one exposure and we look at one outcome, but we need to piece all of these together. And mm. I think it's only when we piece all of these up together, we can look at all of these kind of interrelationships, which is so key. Mm. All the confounding variables are so important. I'd actually love, I don't know if you do this actually, so sorry if you already are, but to look at the effects of stress as well. Because I think that plays such a yep. big impact in all of us today in our society. And I think that has such a big impact on our mental health, mm. on how we're metabolising food, yep. and how bioavailable the food is to us. And sometimes I think we can do all of these checklists well, like looking after our mental health or eating the correct diet as much as we can, um, exercising, movement. But actually, if we're highly stressed and sleep deprived... What does the research that tell us that? And I think that's a, re a really interesting area of research that I'm quite fascinated about personally. Yeah, I mean, we have some great data on that from the PIDIC studies that we're going to start diving into. We have this gold mine of data that unfortunately there's only a certain number of scientists working on it, but we'll get there eventually. Um, and this is something that is, I think is really important and really exciting. And there's a lot more researchers now looking into this because we, we know that it's an important link. Mm. I'm going to come back in two years Great. <laughs> and interview on that one um so lastly Sarah Berry what does live well be well mean to you so to me um I think the the most important thing is being content and happy and I think then the rest of everything else follows if I'm in a good mood then I want to exercise I want to eat well that that to me is it's all up here it's all about being happy content and enjoying life and not taking anything too seriously including what you eat as mm. well great way to end <laughs> thank you so much for coming on pleasure thank you thank you for listening to this week's episode of live well be well 
All the information covered in today's podcast with important links is in today's show notes. And if you haven't yet, please do hit the subscribe button and do share this with friends, family, co-workers, whoever you love, please share this podcast. It means more than you realize. And until next week, I hope you all live well and be well. If you love this podcast, I would really urge you to support us on Patreon. Our Patreon community really do help keep this podcast going. And alongside being within the community, you can also get exclusive access to early release podcasts and specific Q&As with me on topics that you want to hear. Being a Patreon member of this podcast does really help keep the support going because it's not easy to deliver this every week without you guys. So thank you so much. And if you haven't yet subscribed, please go to patreon forward slash livewellbewell to become a member and support this podcast.